Hello and welcome to Conversations with Dr. Bachner. It's Howard Bachner, editor in chief of JAMA. And today I'm I'm joined by uh, two of my favorite people, uh, Derek Angus. Uh, Derek is an associate editor at, at JAMA. He's also the distinguished professor in Mitchell P. Fink Endowed Chair, Critical Care Medicine, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, uh, where he's director of the Department of Critical Care Medicine. And uh, Mauricio Sacconi, who joins me, having followed our our March 13th uh, live stream event. Uh, Mauricio is the head of the Department of Anesthesia and Intensive Care Units at the Humanitas Research Hospital, uh, Humanitas University's president-elect of the European Society of Critical Care Medicine. I would say both of these individuals are stars in critical care. I would call them legends, but they're both too young to be legends, but they're on their way to legendary status. For the listeners today, uh, this is going to be about critical care medicine. So uh, I'm delighted to entertain questions from the listeners, but hopefully they'll be relevant to critical care medicine. We're going to discuss five or six issues. First, the general epidemiology, respiratory support, phenotypes, therapy, and uh, at the moment, a generally neglected topic, uh, what, what do we know is evolving around post-acute care of individuals who've been in the ICU? So Mauricio, starting with you, um, anything new about epidemiology? Or, or uh, are the data pretty well established? Who the risk, uh, what's the major risk characteristics, risk factors, what's the mor mortality look like in the intensive care unit? So hi, Howard, hi Derek, everyone. Um, I guess for me, the last uh, few weeks seeing around uh, how it is being evolving around the world has confirmed a little bit what we've seen in Italy in the first uh, few weeks. Um, if you remember when we talked the first time, we were looking, for instance, also how case fatality rate was quite high in Italy compared to some other countries. And one important uh, issue, I think, is that because we have a disease for which we don't have a vaccine and we don't have specific therapies yet, it seems to me that probably one of the biggest differences that we're seeing around the world is how well uh, systems are able to protect more vulnerable people. And uh, uh, for instance, in Italy, our median age is 62 years of age, which stayed pretty much the same probably throughout the, the pandemic. But if you look at the case fatality rate for the decades of age, when you start to go above 60, 70 and so on, they, they are quite high. And uh, for instance, if you look in, uh, in Europe, other countries that despite having a lot of infections, they seem to have done better. Um, I would say I would quote Germany, for instance, they seem to have done a pretty good job probably in contact tracing and looking at uh, cases and so on. But again, if you look at the median age, at the mean age of their population is quite lower compared to Italy. It's about, I think, 49, 50 years of age. And uh, um, so one of the things that I would say is really, if you're able to protect from getting the disease, the older population, uh, it seems to be a pretty, pretty good thing to do if you can achieve that. Uh, in Italy, in the UK, uh, I worked in the UK before, so I, I stayed in touch with colleagues and I know a little bit also how the, the, the disease spread there. For instance, we have significant problems with long-term facilities and uh, nursing homes. Uh, so, you know, if the disease spreads in those facilities where you have vulnerable old people, I think it's really, it's really bad. And a lot of those, uh, those populations actually, they have a very high uh, case fatality rate. For all concerned intensive care, uh, we do know that if you are, uh, uh, again, old and uh, male and with a hypertension, it seems to be a common trait of uh, people that come to intensive care. Uh, but again, we, we've seen a, a high variety uh, of age groups coming to intensive care. Pediatric populations, they are very rare to see becoming sick. That's a good thing. Uh, but in what, for what concerns the other groups, again, our median age was uh, 63 in Lombardy, which takes into account about 75% of the whole patient population that had coronavirus in Italy. Derek, in Pittsburgh, um, for the people who, who make it into your ICUs, and I know you have many, what's your sense of what the mortality rate is? Um, it really depends on the age distribution. So in Pittsburgh now, um, most of our ICU admissions are actually coming from nursing homes. And mm -hmm. I would say in general, 
that the nursing home mortality rate among patients who are infected is in that 20 to 30 percent. And those who get admitted to the ICU and get intubated, it's even higher, obviously. Um, the patients who get sick but were reasonably healthy beforehand, they just had a comorbidity, but they weren't 80 years of age. Um, I would say, I mean, it's ever evolving, but we definitely get a lot of patients who end up becoming long stay on the ventilator. Um, other than the subset who become long stay on the ventilator, our mortality rate, I would say, would be at the low end of ARDS. Um, uh, there's quite a lot of people who get intubated and do well. So I'm, I'm not quite sure if I've feel like <laughs> it's hard to get it's hard to give precise numbers just one other uh, one other epidemiology question or two um is smoking protective when you look at the literature is smoking protective do either of you think smoking is protective and a asthma is protective so so, so that's like i was actually I was thinking you were going to ask me the same question you'd ask Mauricio. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was thinking in general about what do we not know yet. Right. And I think the only thing that we know uh, very clearly is that the frail elderly, when they get infected, really struggle. Mm -hmm. I think that there's still a lot of questions about all the other frail groups. Uh, who exactly is vulnerable other than the elderly? We've definitely seen in many Western countries that uh, folks from uh, that minority groups and folks who are from uh, uh, po folks who are poor uh, appear to uh, have a disproportionate burden. But the mechanisms for that are still not clear. Unquestionably, a big piece of it could be that. Uh, they get different access to the healthcare system in the first place. But teasing out the relative contribution of underlying uh, heart failure, COPD, even the relative contribution of, for example, patients who, are, uh, who have cancer, it's still not clear. Uh, we still don't really know the mechanism by which relative immunosuppression would increase your risk or not. Some of that's because we still don't have good denominator data. And so it's really hard to work out whether uh, the frequency rate per 100,000 is genuinely higher in those groups. And we still haven't teased out a genetic component yet, which could well be partially explaining why we sometimes hear about people that seem seemingly healthy before they get sick, who then get very sick. Was there some genetic reason for it? we don't really have answers to any of that. So on the one hand, the epidemiology feels re relatively stable and there's a relatively consistent narrative. But on the other hand, I would actually say <laughs> there's a lot that we have still not nailed, yep. including, yeah. including smoking. Yeah. I, I don't the answer to smoking. Well, I'm glad they asked you that question before me <laughs> because I, I also don't have the answer to that. Uh, what I would just add to this is that at the beginning, because this was so surprising and overwhelming for everyone and everyone was trying to help, we had a lot of anecdotal evidence of uh, people saying, I've not seen my cancer patients getting sick, I've not seen my asthma patients getting sick. But then when you started to see bigger series, ACE inhibitors was an example. We all thought maybe there would be, uh, you know, protection or a risk with it. But actually, when we started to see very large series, uh, the effect was not there and uh, I do wonder whether some of the observations around smoking and uh, asthma and other comorbidities actually are going to follow a similar uh, similar way when we actually study on a much larger uh, population. So uh, I would say I agree with Derek. To me, um, I don't know yet which one is a risk factor that makes you more susceptible to get the virus, but certainly uh, age and uh, frailty is something that if you do get the virus, you're very likely to do worse than other. For instance, uh, I also see the same thing in age. In Italy, we have, uh, unfortunately, something like 30,000 deaths. If you split the age, uh, you know, in a very gross way, like more than 50 and less than 50, 
less than 50 years of age, I think we have roughly 400 deaths in the whole country, and that takes into account also who comes to intensive care. Above that, we have all the other deaths. Yeah, so... Well, can, wait, I, I want to go, I got to go to the second question. We'll be here for two hours. Okay. Can I just add a little point? A little point. <laughs> so, it's actually got two pieces. So, the, the, in Pennsylvania, there have been more deaths over 100 than mm -hmm. there have under 50. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. The second, the second thing is even the elderly, we don't really know why. So, for example, if it's immune senescence, then that might be true for anyone over the age of 65. If it's not immune senescence, then in countries with a lower mean age rate because of greater acquisition of comorbidity earlier, then the consequences of being elderly may. Uh, may be borne by people who are relatively younger in, for example, ailments. And that's also unknown. Well, now I want to go to a subject uh, that is complicated and controversial. So I think uh, many of the listeners in critical care know we published a paper by two legends, true legends, uh, John Marini and Luciano Gattinari, uh, entitled Management of COVID-19 Respiratory Distress. It's attracted quite a bit of attention and I, I would say some controversy. And Derek warned me when we accepted it that, uh, you know, people would have mixed feelings about it. Uh, Mauricio, you probably have cared for as many patients with COVID-19 as virtually any critical care physician in, uh, in the world, certainly as many. Where, where are we on respiratory support? Uh, high flow oxygen, prone positioning, preventing intub intubation. Is early intubation better than late intubation? So you may want to prevent intubation, but do you wait too late? You've been at mm -hmm. it for three months. W what do you think you now know? So uh, I would say that after three months, I still know that I don't know a lot of things about this virus. And therefore, because I didn't know a lot of things about this virus and it was new, new to us, but we were used to manage acute respiratory failure, ARDS and, uh, you know, severe respiratory failure. With my team, actually, we decided to have a very uh, reproducible, very simple approach. So we thought we do behave as if we have one patient in front of us, not as if we have 107 patients, which is what happened in my unit at some point. So. I would say I don't think I changed my practice in terms of the management of acute respiratory failure. So um, people often ask me, so was non-invasive ventilation a contraindication to these patients? Actually, I don't think it was because I don't think it was even before this. What the contraindication is, is if patients are getting tired, or if you get the feeling that they're getting tired, then I would not delay an intubation there. Um, but again, in the way we manage these patients, there is one thing that is true, I would say, and that was an apparent uh, pattern from the, after you manage the first 10, 15 cases, you realize that there is a pattern in these patients. And so very often they are um, hypoxemic, but actually carbon dioxide clearance is not a problem. And they seem to have, not all of them, but a majority of them, they seem to have reasonably good compliance. So when you do intubate them, you often find that you don't need a lot of pressure to ventilate these lungs. Actually, that could be counterproductive. Um, but I did find some patients that had a low compliance compared to others. So what I would say is that I found my average group of patients compared to the average RDS before moved to a slightly higher compliance group. But I didn't like to use the same PEEP in every patient. I still uh, try to individualize PEEP and uh, look at both the respiratory system. And my passion is always being hemodynamics and looking at the hemodynamics component of what I was seeing in front of my eyes, patients on patients. So, so bottom line is I didn't change my practice on CPAP and NIV, but I decided not to, uh, not to drag patients on NIV as I was not doing before. And, uh, and when we ventilated this patient, we still try to apply protective lung strategies. Uh, protective lung strategies doesn't mean that you use the same strategy for everyone. You use the same approach for everyone. But patients may get different levels of PEEP, different levels of uh, uh, pressure support or pressure control ventilation or volume control ventilation, which we use quite a lot uh, at the beginning. 
prone positioning prior to intubation? Yeah. No, we didn't have experience in my institution with uh, prone positioning prior to intubation. I know that you published uh, a, a paper from one of the groups in a nearby hospital here. Right. A few um, a few colleagues actually told me that they, they use it a lot. I was probably lucky to be in an area that got a lot of admissions, but I was able to support the other hospitals rather than being overwhelmed by the admissions of my emergency department. So I never had to use rescue strategies in the ward. I always had enough space uh, to escalate to intensive care if I thought it was appropriate for the patient. So uh, we didn't use prone positioning in awake patients. I know that many people are doing that. Um, they do respond pretty well to prone in these patients. So you, you do see that there is an increase in, in, uh, in PLO2 after you prone them. What I do not know is because we never had experience of uh, awake proning before, is if these transient increase into a physiological variable, so into a PO2 on proning when you're awake, is then translated into a better outcome a long term. Mm -hmm. I think no one knows that because we didn't have time to do a trial on it and to and and to see really if, if you know the improvement in numbers that you see at the bedside is translated also into patient-centered outcomes later on. Right. The two papers we published were research letters, and I think both of them comment yeah. that it, it's nice to have short-term gain, but what you really want to look at is what, what does it mean in terms of 28-day mortality or 60-day mortality. Derek, you've yeah. seen more patients now over the last month or six weeks. What's your sense uh, of kind of the approach to respiratory support? Well, so I still think that our experience is dwarfed by that of Mauricio's. And uh, mm. so I really have, uh, uh, it's hard for me to think that I have anything to add. I think um, reflecting not only what we've seen in Pittsburgh, but, but what we've heard uh, from around the world, uh, it's not clear to me that people would have even tried proning prior to intubation had it not been because they were under extreme circumstance. Um, the very fact that it's become an option has definitely been um, uh, uh, necessity being the mother of invention. Um, but uh, it, it, it seems plausible that there's definitely a role for much more aggressive pre-intubation management, including, for example, if you're using NIV and then you can safely prone, you maybe avoid intubating people. I totally get that the long-term consequences are unclear. On the other hand, intubating someone can be hazardous for their health. Um, so do, do we need an actual RCT um, of trying to do NIV with proning uh, as a legitimate strategy? It, it sort of feels like it would be valuable, but it also feels like it's quite a hard trial to even pull mm -hmm. off. Um, I think I would broadly say that there's been this learned conventional wisdom to be more aggressive in the use of non-invasive strategies writ broadly in the early management of these patients than we would necessarily have done traditionally. And to the extent that there's some wisdom in the masses, um, it seems reasonable. Um, I'm beyond that. <laughs> and to be honest, I think it's it uh, yeah. <laughs> Now, I just uh, wanted to add that I suspect it also depends on what you're most familiar with. I think that's one of the messages that we decided to to use with our with my team and we were trying to to say let's try to do what we are most familiar with and uh, for instance in italy there is a, a big tradition a long tradition of a helmet CPAP, uh, right. which for instance when i was in the uk in the nhs i very rarely used and and i kind of learned it here in the last two years and a half i've been here we use quite a bit of it. Indeed, my colleagues from the region, if I say the word non-invasive ventilation, they will tell me you're wrong. It's not a ventilation. It's just a CPAP. Because by the time you're adding pressure and you ventilate, probably is the time to intubate. And I guess that's been our, our experience here. We tried to put a bit of positive pressure with helmet CPAP. We managed probably uh, an equal number of uh, uh, beds for CPAP and non-invasive ventilation compared to what we manage in terms of invasive mechanical ventilation. So we use quite a lot of it. We are actually analyzing the data for some of this, which is being a large population, and we're going to see 
what the outcomes are. But I can tell you that even in my institution, we have some patients that completely recovered without going through invasive mechanical ventilation and just spending days on CPAP and they were discharged home. The, the, the only other thing I would say is there's definitely quite a lot of reports of people who are sick enough to be admitted. They're not initially terribly, terribly hypoxemic, but when they develop hypoxemia, it can be very rapid. Yeah. And so, and so if, if you admit someone and you manage them non-invasively and you put them in a setting where there isn't rapid access to someone who is facile in intubation, it, it is, that's definitely potentially risky. So, so, so the one caveat about aggressive use of non-invasive ventilation is to do it in a setting where if nonetheless the patient does deteriorate, you still have rapid access to someone who can secure an earway and put them on invasive uh, ventilation. Uh, I completely agree. And indeed for us, probably one of the biggest challenges where we were really constrained on the number of beds for invasive mechanical ventilation was how do you set up non-invasive ventilation beds in a safe way so that exactly you don't miss the deterioration? You don't want to be called for a cardiac arrest. You have to go there much earlier and, and escalate much earlier. So that was a, uh, the biggest challenge was probably how do you bring intensive care out of the out of the walls of intensive care? Now we're going to turn to the next two areas. They're related and they're really complicated in the sense that are there phenotypes? And should phenotypes drive therapy? Now, uh, for people who are, uh, I talk to Derek every day, either by email or phone, and I will give you a partial list of what's crossed my desk as treatment. Ozone therapy, vitamin D, lysotrophic agents, diet manipulation, thymus regeneration, hyperparexia, TOSI, cyclosporin, heparin, icotikban, zinc and AZT, plasma exchange, low-dose radiation, uh, combination drugs. Did, did we launch the RCTs before we knew the phenotype? And perhaps the reason remdesivir hasn't been so successful is you don't want to use it on everyone. We, we just published a paper on convalescent plasma with a 10% reduction in mortality. Derek knows I was going to ask this question. Mauricio, I sent you this question thrombosis and heparin, are there phenotypes that we've missed and do we need to marry treatment to these phenotypes? Uh, we'll go back and forth on this one because I, I, I could read another list of 20 more ideas about treatments. Mauricio? Hey, Derek can go first if All you right, want. All right, Derek, you go first <laughs> on this one. <laughs> well, anyone who knows me knows that, um, um, of course, there are subsets of patients, and it's highly likely that um, uh, therapies might have broad effects, uh, but some of them not not only might the the relative risk be reduced uh, differentially. Uh, so, sorry, not, not only might the absolute risk vary um, by subgroup, but the relative risk might vary. So there could be true heterogeneity of treatment effect, and indeed some therapies might be actively harmful. In subgroups, um, the you you put heparin on the list. Right. I think uh, everyone is very worried that some important subset of patients uh, have some sort of fairly serious uh, endotheliitis and um, endotheliopathy, and it may well be that uh, nothing short of therapeutic anticoagulation uh, will save them. But therapeutic anticoagulation has a known side effect profile. And so it might be quite hazardous to put every patient on therapeutic anticoagulation. Um, and an important subset may see no benefit from that degree. So right off the bat, I think people who are wanting to study anticoagulation might restrict it only to those who are the sickest patients, those who are the sickest patients with at least some signs that there is an important component of this endotheliopathy. So for example, maybe you should only give it to patients with elevated D-dimers, elevated D-dimers and a bad shunt, suggesting maybe VQ mismatch and so on. Um, I think tied to this, you're asking, should we have waited before starting right. the trials? Yeah. No, 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 no. All right. 
Um, but it does mean that it's not enough to do one trial. So in other words, you, you could start a trial, you could have a design like an adaptive platform trial that actually tries to learn by phenotype over time, or you can just make a commitment to doing sequential trials where a big trial might run and there might be a negative effect, uh, a neutral effect overall, but a promising subgroup, then you should go and test in the subgroup. Now, you still need to try to be safe. So you wouldn't want to roll out in thousands of patients a therapy with a known safety concern in a subgroup that you that you have poor rationale for expecting benefit. But with those caveats in place, I think you start with what you have and then you refine over time. And that's what we did admittedly over decades, but that's what we did with acute myocardial infarction. STEMIs and non-STEMIs were all thrown together. Uh, you learn over time. It's just the compressed time scale makes it look like there's more room for sort of decisional regret uh, because we can still remember the, st- the trial we began two and a half months ago. But, but this phenotypic variation should not have stopped us from launching trials as soon as possible. Before Mauricio, before you comment, mm-hmm. and Derek knew I was going to a- ask him uh, this question. Are, are there other phenotypes that you think are emerging? You know, this thrombosis, this inflammatory cascade. Uh, are there uh, are there uh, others that you think are emerging, or we're just not smart enough to know? Are you asking me? I'm asking you, Derek. Uh, and now go to Mauricio. Oh, oh no, no, no. Because you yeah, went yeah. to you so went. I'll, I'll give you. Because we give went you to adaptive designs. But before you got to adaptive yeah, designs, yeah. I mean, you know, I have cyclosporin on the list. I have I'll, low I'll, dose I'll radiation on the list. No, I'll give you one immediately. Um, uh, viruses make you lymphopenic. Uh, everyone talks about the cytokine storm and wants to blunt in a immunity but maybe there's an important subset of patients in whom the biggest problem is that they need support for their adaptive immune system uh, maybe there's a subset of patients in whom we should be boosting immunity not suppressing immunity just mm-hmm. again by the way all right don't try this at home <laughs> I, I, this, i'm only suggesting this is a hypothesis worthy of testing Nothing I'm saying here suggests people should go out and just start these treatments. I'm thinking about this inside the context of randomized trials. Mauricio, do you have a sense? I mean, you've seen so many patients. Are there different phenotypes? I think there are different phenotypes, and I think that's what people try to to do. If I mean, if with phenotypes you try to classify a disease in subgroup of disease where you find common patterns of, uh, you know, IL-6 and the dimers and so on. I think that's what people have tried to do quite a lot here. Uh, I'll come back to, to the fact that, uh, you know, we, we often talk about preparedness, about the pandemic. I think there is a big concept about research preparedness that at least probably in Europe, we were, I don't think we were as ready as we could have been. Um, but going back to the phenotypes, I think one of the problems that you have, you may recognize a pattern interfering with that pattern. And there has been a lot of use of compassionate use of drugs and off label drugs. It's a big jump between association and causality. And not only that, a lot of the so-called phenotypes, they don't even come from large series of patients. They often came from anecdotal evidence. And then this evidence, anecdotal evidence, they started to, you know, to become experts, consensus or uh, consensus about people. Yes, there is a cytokine release syndrome, which again, you know, we had some little evidence about it. We don't really know if it is a common part in, in a lot of these patients. So I've seen a big rush to, to treat uh, trying, I'm sure every doctor tried to do their best. I don't think anyone tried drugs to, to harm patients. However, I completely agree with what Derek was saying. Until you don't really know the mechanics very well with a good observations and also then with, uh, with trials, we really do not know if what we are doing not only lacks efficacy, which is a problem, but maybe brings harm. And, you know, first do not harm, I think, should be our our first uh, first strategy. In my intensive care, for instance, uh, we decided not to start adjunctive therapies pretty much in any patient. So we didn't start 
anything new. We had a lot of patients coming with off-label drugs from the wards and maybe free even from the community because there was a wide use of hydroxychloroquine as it is in, for instance, in, in many other countries. Probably the only therapy that I decided in selected cases to use as being steroids. Steroids are also controversial in viral disease. Uh, but I, I took an approach that if I didn't know, I would try not to use something and just try to do as best supportive therapy. Mauricio, do you think, uh, I mean, the remdesivir trials are interesting, uh, one negative, one positive in the sense of shortened ICU day, kind of a 3% reduction in mortality. Our convalescent tighter paper suggests in seriously ill, not critically ill, potentially a 10 to 15% absolute reduction in, in, um, in mortality. Is it going to take more than one drug? You mentioned steroids. That's a question that came up. Yeah. Is, it, is it convalescent plasma and steroids? Is it TOSI and steroids? Is it going I, to, I, to really I, reduce I, mortality? Is it going to be a combination of some sort? It's going to be a combination of some sort, but again, I'm an intensivist. I like to talk also about intensive care. I really believe that, you know, good evidence-based, simple, supportive therapy doesn't cure the disease, but by precious time, avoiding causing harm with the organ support that we, we do. And that can, uh, you know, can impact significantly, I think, also mortality. But probably for something, until we don't have a vaccine, I don't really believe we will find the magic bullet. And that's why it's going to be even more important uh, doing proper trials, I think. I don't think just with observations and without proper controls, you can realistically spot a difference of three, four percent in your practice. You will just believe what you want to believe. Um, so I guess a combination of treatments probably is one of the things that we have to explore. I guess the nice things about the remdesivir trial uh, and, the, and the convalescent plasma trial is two things. One, first of all, that we managed to get a trial of 1,000 patients, which is a pretty impressive effort during a pandemic. Yeah. Uh, even though the primary outcome was changed, uh, but you know there are good explanations for for which they did that. So I, I actually I do believe the the data. I think it's a, I think it's a good trial. It doesn't uh, it's not going to be a game changer for everything, but I think it's a good trial. And the convalescent plasma trial that you published recently, I think, is also it's a nice one because at least it's showing. Uh, it was not made for that, but at least it's showing that probably the the treatment is relatively safe. You had very few side effects there. And if you look at the cytochromatory outcomes, even if they were not significant, they were all moved towards some possible benefits for plasma, at least in the severe uh, cases, not for the life-threatening ones. Right. So I think for, and, and that's, unfortunately, that's the thing for me and Derek, we work in intensive care. We are at the end of the, <laughs> we are at the end of the process. Very often what we can do is really support uh, the organs there and avoid doing extra damage. But actually, if you really believe that the therapy should stop the disease or should stop the progression of the disease, I suspect they will, they will have to be given earlier, probably. I suspect when you're in intensive care, maybe a little bit late. Derek, do you think it, it's some form of two drugs? Is it earlier treatment with some drug regimen? Right. So I think that antivirals have the best chance if given very early. An effective antiviral that stops viral replication essentially turned COVID into sepsis. Uh, if the patient is already sick and still doing viral replication, but now has multi-system organ failure, if we arrest viral replication, then we've essentially got a patient who's like a patient with bacterial sepsis for whom we have an antibiotic that kills the bacterium. And having an antibiotic that kills the bacterium does not cure you of sepsis. Um, so I think that something like remdesivir could totally shorten the course. Just it's quite plausible. The, find, the findings in the New England are quite believable. But shortening the course is not the same as um, completely curing people. And for that, almost certainly, we'll still need to think about all the essentially the same chase for effective, supportive, and directed therapy that we chase in sepsis, the right kinds of organ dysfunction support. And ultimately, the holy grail would be doing optimal support of the host 
immune response and not just the immune response but all the secondary cascades so for example if someone already has endotheliopathy and has already got extensive microvascular coagulation eventually that might undergo vascular remodeling but simply stopping the virus from replicating doesn't immediately remove from that person the threat to life that that's being uh, engendered by this sort of distributed microvascular coagulation in their pulmonary vasculature and so on. Now, my understanding is 17,000 people in the U.S. have gotten convalescent plasma, more than have gotten remdesivir, actually, because it's so readily available. What What's your sense of that as a, a, a treatment? Yeah. Um, the study we published was small. Yeah, so um, it's not the first study, <laughs> as, as you've heard me say before. JAMA published a study on convalescent serum in 1918 <laughs> for Spanish flu. So we've been we've been banging on this nail for a long time. Um, there's the rationale is really strong. Yeah. Uh, again, the issue is when should it be given? Uh, the, if it's adequately safe and adequately plentiful, then one would want to move it earlier in the course. Um, and one would ultimately think that convalescent serum, of course, will be replaced by synthetic antibodies right. that could be more targeted, right. smaller total dose, and if adequately safe, could almost be given as a sort of prophylaxis for high-risk groups and so on. Uh, essentially, widespread passive immunization. Uh, and that's sort of the end game, I think, for this class of therapies in this intermediate time period before we have uh, widespread effect of synthetic antibodies. I think convalescent plasma uh, is intriguing. Um, how, what's the fidelity of the product from person to person or from aliquot to aliquot? That's, that'll be tricky to know. Um, and when is the best time to use it? Should you use it in ICU patients or should you move it upstream and use it in nursing homes? I think there's a lot to be said for trying, even with convalescent serum, to try to move it earlier in the process. Um, Mauricio, uh, you've seen an en enormous number of patients who've been discharged. Uh, and mm -hmm. I, I appreciate all of the complications of where they go and, and home care. Does the morbidity associated with COVID-19 following being in the ICU look different to you than any other frail elderly individual who's in the ICU and is either intubated or not? Does it look different to you? Do they need a different type of post-ICU care? It's a very good question, uh, and it's probably a bit earlier to to tell you what's going to happen to these patients. No healthcare system has seen this amount of pneumonias all at the same time. So the burden even on rehabilitation and post-intensive care syndrome is going to be massive. Um, we are doing some follow-ups in my hospital, and what we are seeing now are the first survivors that came back. Uh, I'm going to give a very biased answer in the sense that these people are able to come back to follow up and that's already a good thing because they can either be in a car with their family and so on. We anecdotally, we are surprised to see how much some of them have been able to recover even in, in old age. However, I can also tell you that probably the last 10%, 10-15% of patients after the, the pandemic peak have been very long uh, term uh, winning patients in our intensive care unit. And I even know about some young patients that are now recovering, uh, but they had trachees for uh, you know two months and uh, it's going to be a very long process. And if you speak with them, they still tell you that they are fatigued. They are now uh, investigated by pneumologists in terms of uh, you know, fibrosis. We are seeing some of the usual complications like tracheal stenosis. So, the, var the variety is so high that I would expect a, a significant burden also in terms of what is a uh, follow-up for this patient. However, the nice thing is that uh, we have seen a significant group of patients that seems to have made a full recovery, and some of them even uh, older patients in their 70s that are walking to our follow-up clinic 
uh, we are now investigating six minutes walking test and we are trying to see what they what they are doing and some of them they they've had a good recovery but there is certainly and I cannot quantify how big it is but with the huge number of patients that we treated is going to be an absolute big number uh, there is certainly a group of patients that require uh, a lot of help to try to go back to a, a reasonable quality of life and we don't know if they're going to have permanent damage to their lungs. Derek, a sense of post-COVID care needs yet? A, a, a sense of whether these patients need more or less than any other patient being discharged from the ICU who's older? Yeah, so I think uh, we really don't know yet, but there's lots of reason to have some concern that this would be sort of a nasty bite in the tail of this epidemic. Um, I think we know in the past that the amount of respiratory damage from severe ARDS is relatively speaking, comparatively mild. The patients who survive sometimes have uh, a few sort of respiratory function abnormalities, but the, the more striking overwhelming picture is usually one of general physical deconditioning and also a wide array of mental health concerns. And I have two worries about this. One, the, the physical health rehabilitation, regaining uh, sort of motor skills, uh, regaining girdle strength for getting in and out of chairs. That involves intensive physical therapy rehab. And one has to worry about how much of the physical therapy workforce was somewhat furloughed or unable to engage uh, in usual services because there was such disruption to healthcare systems uh, at a time when it might have been particularly vital to be doing rehab. And then by extension, similarly, um, I'm worried about the quality of mental health support for, um, especially since if anything, being sick with COVID was probably worse than being sick with other ICU illnesses. Patients had protracted periods in the ICU totally alone where they couldn't access family members and so on. Um, and so I wouldn't be surprised if some of the mental health sequelae from pr protracted COVID disease um, uh, manifests at a higher incidence and a higher burden than it does in general ICU populations. I think you're right. The um, same two questions to the two of you to finish. We'll start with you, Mauricio. Um, the, the two or three surprises of this pandemic from a critical care standpoint and the two or three scientific questions that we need to answer. And then, Derek, the same for you, the two or three surprises and the two or three most important scientific questions. Mauricio? Well, I guess the surprise was uh, finding out that we had a cluster in the region that was a big surprise. And I guess that uh, was also with, uh, with insight uh, really made me realize how much we underestimated what was happening uh, in China. And also it made me realize how our systems, I, I worked in the NHS and I'm working in Italy, our system, they are not really made to work on a kind of a buffer of resources to be used uh, during a pandemic. They are, uh, they are always, not to the limit, but you know, our capacity is 90, 95% of uh, ICU capacity in winter. We, are, we were not ready to manage uh, to manage a pandemic. I think that's that's been clear um, everywhere. And I think that's what's the, the biggest surprise, how many sick patients can come at once if you have a disease like this coming. That was really surprising and kind of uh, kind of scary, actually, at the beginning, I would say. The, 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 the initial wave that we saw was really something that we thought, if this does not peak, we don't know where we're going to go next. Um, the other thing that caught us a little bit by surprise, I would say, I don't think we were ready to do uh, also research properly in a pandemic, in the sense that uh, what Derek uh, is leading some of these adaptive trial designs like Remap Cup and so on. I wished we had put the infrastructure in place to start using it, you know, almost after a week, after two weeks. Now we are now in the process of doing that. Um, and I would say, you know, these are the two things that, that caught me by surprise in terms of uh, uh, things that have been a nice surprise is really being the resilience 
of people uh, working together for a common goal. Uh, during those uh, six, seven weeks of the peak in Lombardy, uh, I mean, I'm so proud of my team, but I'm really so proud of everyone. And I'm so proud of all my colleagues around the world. I, I spoke with people in different countries and I know that I hear exactly the same stories everywhere, is how much we, we pulled together for a common goal, which was really trying to give intensive care to whoever need and benefit. Uh, intensive care. And I would say probably that made me realize that we spend too much time talking about ventilators, too much time talking about machines and, and bed spaces and less time about people. Uh, if, if there is one key lesson for me and with the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine now we are collaborating with the uh, European Commission, so with the European Union to try to get ready for a second wave if there is a second wave or for for something else in the future, there is a clear need to try to uh, bring an harmonization of uh, competencies, I would say, and also maybe to to be able to bring competencies where they are most needed. There, there is one common thing in this pandemic, if you notice, clusters, they don't occur around the world at the same time. Lombardy was one, then a few weeks later there was another one. What we've done in many countries was creating some empty facilities just in case, but then we didn't have the doctors and nurses to put in these facilities. And I, I would have kind of a vision to have a, an healthcare army that could be moved from place to place. So rather than creating empty spaces, why don't we move the competencies where they are needed? Everyone was trying to get new ventilators to be there just in case. Probably what we needed was to move competencies from intensive care clinicians, nurses and allied care professionals to where they were needed. And I think that, again, was a mindset that we didn't have. And I would like to have it for a second wave if something like this happening again. I hope it doesn't happen, but I wouldn't like to be surprised twice by something like this. Derek, the, the scientific questions that, you know, linger in your mind. Yeah, so Mauricio said, I mean, I would agree with everything he said. Uh, I guess I would start by taking up with his last point. It's really fascinating, the, the patchiness. So not only do they not happen at the same time, but Rome never behaved the way Milan did. Mm -hmm. um, and as we all watched New York, and it was so awful, we really felt Boston, San Francisco, Seattle – uh, and then New Orleans and, you know, that they would all follow a similar pattern. And, and some of it, maybe school closings and social distancing began a little bit earlier, but it's hard to explain why some cities just have a terrible disease outbreak and others don't. And some of it could be the actions we take, but there's still a lot that we don't understand about that. As far as scientific questions about um, you probably want us to talk about scientific questions for ICU patients and yes. get right into the syndrome <laughs> of the disease. That's okay. And yet, and yet, it's <laughs> it's actually. I feel like with remdesivir, we've just created a viral sepsis, and I almost feel like for me, the pressure of solving viral sepsis is no more prescient than the pressure of solving sepsis. I actually feel like um, once we have effective antivirals, in a way for me, the biggest danger is that the only treatment we're using right now is massive social distancing. And mm -hmm. as you've heard me talk about before, the consequences of the treatment may be worse or as bad as if not worse than the disease. And so for me, a scientific agenda would be um, how can we truly protect the vulnerable? Mm -hmm. How can we protect patients in nursing homes so that we can really open the rest of the economy, not have our children not be in school, not have people losing their jobs, but get on with normal life? Because the social distancing, we as an intensive care community, we needed that as a short-term fix to avoid a complete unmitigated disaster of ICUs being completely overrun. But ICUs can be run. They just can't be overrun. Mm -hmm. We can manage a lot of COVID while the rest of society carries on. 
So I would, I think the most important scientific agenda is just the strategy for protecting the frail and managing like a surveillance system so that, so that homo sapiens can get back to being homo sapiens. Yeah, I, I think it's a very valid point. We, you know, we, we often talk about precision medicine and uh, you know, the concept of a, you know, a kind of a precision public health measures we, we've not really applied properly. Uh, you're right, everyone was doing social distancing in the same way, and I completely agree what we were saying at the beginning. If you, if you look at case fatality rate in different countries, certainly countries that have done better in protecting the vulnerable at a much less burden on their healthcare system and uh, good for patients that less death as well. So, uh, Mauricio, you, um, we did the live stream on March 13th. And um, it almost seems almost like a, a different decade ago. And um, you, in s some fashion that I've struggled to understand, announced to the world um, that we didn't quite know what was happening or was going to happen and that we needed to be prepared in a different way. This was based upon what was then a week or two of experience, and I've said this before, uh, you, uh, along with Dr. Fauci uh, in the United States, uh, have, have crystallized more than any other two people uh, around the world uh, this pandemic. Um, uh, s somehow the earnestness and the, and the goodness and the generosity of being a, a physician. Um, I, I can't emphasize that enough. I, I don't think I've ever been prouder of my profession as I have been in the last three months. And and Derek, you you know I how highly I think of you as a friend and a, a colleague, and you've made me kind of an honorary ICU member. I just don't ever want to have to take care of a patient in an ICU, nor do patients want that. But uh, I, I can't, think of two people who could better represent a discipline. Uh, this is Howard Bachner, editor-in-chief of uh, JAMA, and I've been talking with Mauricio Sacconi, president-elect of ESICM, and Derek Angus, our associate editor and uh, an endowed professor at UPM, uh, UPMC. Mauricio, thank you for your time today. I'm glad you can see your children again. And Derek, thank you for your time today, and I know you are already seeing your children today. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.